neighborhood attacks and a girl presumed dead leads to the arrest of the local college instructor. But as the attacks continue, will the community find another suspect closer to home? The book, Invisible Girl, the author, Lisa Jewell. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get lit. Readers, this is Alexis. And this is Kari. And you're listening to Lit Society, a podcast about books and drama. Kari, do I remember correctly you don't watch any TV news? Oh, no. Heavens no. I do not. I get my news from Twitter. I know you <laughs> do, though. <laughs> no, no. I stopped listening to news when the pandemic hit, remember? Oh, very good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you don't get it from Skim anymore, hey? I I have been off of my skim. So skim is a a week, a daily newsletter that gives you just the top news and it helps to keep you informed. Um, I liked it because I found it to be less biased than a lot of news stations. Uh Um, Uh-huh. So now that you're getting your information from Twitter, have you come across any (laughs) misleading headlines where you thought you were going to... learn about one thing and it never got to the point. Absolutely. Yeah. I spent like an hour reading about how Paula Patton messed up Zendaya's name. And and then later I was like, I never cared about any of that. So yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't really have a good news source. Yeah. I don't know who does these days. Well, why don't we jump into the theme of the week? As you know, readers, each week, we select a theme to discuss based on the book we are reading. This week's theme will be how to avoid misleading information in the news and social media. Thank you. I've needed this. I'm so <laughs> excited to get into this conversation. OK, and a conversation it shall be today. <laughs> you know, we have access to endless source of information, phones, TV, just Wherever you get information, just walking down the street, as they call it, a little bit of tea, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway, (laughs) anybody can write an article and post it. You don't really even have to have credentials behind that. Am I right? Absolutely not. You know, I know I used to be a blogger. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what they call them, <laughs> bloggers. But sometimes these bloggers go laugh. Or all right. <laughs> oh, all right. Either way, they veer. Okay, right. that's the point. Mm-hmm. Um, We got to be careful so we're not caught up in this misleading information. So we got to first... I mean, if you think about it, at the height of the pandemic, and it's probably still happening today, there was a lot of misleading information. Oh, for sure. So we got to cross check. Yeah, be diligent about avoiding uh, misinformation because it can stick in our mind even after we've decided to ignore it. We've seen it. Maybe our heart is involved and we believe it a little bit. So what are you going to do? Yeah. So um, first off, a lot of times we'll see sponsored content. Yeah. Like what they don't want you to know about weight loss, COVID, da 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 da, whatever. Mm-hmm. What they don't want you to know. But the information that is sponsored is typically biased. It's got right. somebody supporting and paying for it to lean one way. So you have to pay attention to sponsored content. And usually that comes now with a little header that says sponsored. It lets you know at the top that it's an advertisement in print or online Uh, legally. It's supposed to always be marked. Even social media um, is supposed to have a sponsored tag when sponsored. And then there's the um, really short headlines. They and they come, they're short headlines, but they come with really long articles and way too many ads. With these short headlines, they don't give you enough information, but bait you into clicking to get more information. And unfortunately, as we mentioned, you don't always get the information that you you were looking for I've clicked on those man when I'm like I really just want to know one thing it'll the headline will be like um you won't believe this new rule for all travelers 
And then yes. you click on it and it's like travel started in the 1600s <laughs> and then it'll be an ad and it'll be like, and today people are still traveling and it'll be five more ads. And then at the end, it'll be like, you know, travelers be safe out there. I don't know. And it, like, it is the weirdest second. thing. Why? Yeah. Why is that OK? Yeah. Why is that OK? But that <laughs> I done got caught up in that way too many times. And I have told myself, you know, this is one of those articles and I get sucked in again. But the algorithm is following your life and it's giving you these ads. They're basically ads because it knows what you're doing right now and what you're planning for in the near future. So it pertains to you and you're more yeah. likely to click on it. We all think we're smart, especially technology wise. Uh, you and I are pretty savvy but you know it can happen to anybody it can it can indeed uh, what about the articles that say source but when you get into the article it's um it, uh what do you call them an anonymous source so I, believe, I mean anonymous know. sources are necessary but uh yeah you do have to be careful because sometimes the writer is the anonymous source <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> so if you and, see an and, article online and it's like anonymous source, this is the best podcast in the world, the only podcast you need to listen to. And you <laughs> click on it and it's like Lit Society Propaganda. Yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> I am the anonymous source. <laughs> so as you can see, the anonymous source, how trustworthy are they? What Not is enough. their <laughs> angle? Yeah, that you got to be careful about these anonymous sources. <laughs> One of the articles I read said that investment bankers have been known to use this uh, source tactic um, to leak potential merger and acquisition information or even IPO offerings or uh, news to gain support. But it could be an effort within their organization to publicly save dying negotiations. So we really do have to be careful about anonymous sources. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, what if um, the, you, you also have to, uh, we have to understand that these um, people with agendas and some of them being scary people are very savvy when it comes to manipulation. So a source might leak, for example, um, the president on unexplicably fell off a bike after robbing a bank. <laughs> <laughs> and then you read in the actual news that you trust that, um, well, part of this did happen. So I accept that all of it happened. The source was right. I have insider information. And for some reason, mm -hmm. people aren't woke enough to see what I see. You know, I'm right. so smart because I believe this random source. So there's some danger there. Um, a lot of times they appeal to people's uh, pride. People want to have insider information and know more than their Ooh. friends. OK, and then there's um, articles that offer headline questions, but don't provide the answer. So that's mm -hmm. another thing when we're looking at headlines that we could pay attention to. Are Carisha and Diddy dating? I still don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I mean, they're just really out there and we be wanting to know the Real answer. Real bad. Yeah, we want to know. <laughs> he didn't thank you in the speech, Carisha. Please, Carisha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's consider some thoughts on how to avoid this. So we just kind of talked a little bit about the kind of headlines that are out there. Let's talk about how to avoid. Okay. So pay attention to why the article was written. Make sure the article directly relates to the main point, provides additional information to, to help you understand the article. See if the article is biased, if it's leaning to one particular side of another or another. If the article is not presenting all sides of the story, then it's not a balanced article. And this isn't a case of there being good people on both sides. That's not what we're saying. But if the article is giving you more than the facts, if it's telling you more than this happened at this date with this information, this is what we know. And instead, it's infusing emotion into it. For example, um, I was watching a news program and the um, news personality, because they're not journalists, was like this politician um, hates this group of people. Okay. First of all, I already know that. <laughs> Second of all, what is you telling me this? What is this for? 
who is this benefiting? Yeah. All it's doing is trying to appeal to my emotions so that I'm more loyal to your program. Because I feel like you're a friend. You feel like how I feel. And we shouldn't be friends with the news. <laughs> It's just right. the news. It's just the information source. <laughs> it's just the information. Stop feeding me your emotion and just give me the information. Yeah. Um, so. mm-hmm. And that goes to making generalizations and, and the news that, that has come out of the mouths of our, um, our newscasters or our um, articles that we've read. We've seen journalizations and that shouldn't be the case. They should not be making sweeping general generalizations throughout an article. Cite sources should be properly cited. And again, we're looking for a balanced um, approach to this article that's being written. And if it's not giving what it's supposed to give, then we need to move on. Yeah. I like that. Um. Kari mentioned appealing to your emotions that can come in a form of exaggerations or even false information. Um, we also want to be careful with the use of in- imagery because sometimes the graphic nature of the imagery, be it a video or just a, a photo, can be used to shock you. And um, as Kari mentioned, persuade the reader emotionally. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that the imagery is inaccurate. It's not telling the story as it, sh- as it happened. That is so true. And even if it is accurate, sometimes I don't need that on my soul. If you tell me that 500 people were killed in a bombing in this part of the world, I believe you. And I am hurt by that. I do not need to see images of those people's bodies, they've lost their right to consent to their images being um, published. All of it is wrong and icky. Uh, Mm -hmm. So sometimes for me, I just try to avoid images, graphic images, violent images in the news. I have to um, work on that a little bit because if there's a picture. Love it. You just be a glutton for pain. (laughs) Yeah. I like, I want to see the picture. Is there a video? I want to see the video. And I don't, I think I, I've become desensitized to it Mm. in that I'm not, I don't feel emotionally impacted by it, Mm -hmm. which is sad. So I really got to step away. Mm -hmm. And then don't believe everything you hear or read. I mean, my goodness, you know, it's deep fakes out there. They creating videos yeah. of real people doing things they never said or did. Images can be altered, as I mentioned, but these deep fakes are real. And when do we know? How do we know? How do we know that they're fake? What can be admitted in a court of law? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If you can't trust what you see. Yeah, you can't trust what you see. And if you can't trust what you see, ugh, life is a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I've um, definitely been a part of the court of public opinion and placed blame on people because of something I saw on Twitter, a video Mm -hmm. I saw on Twitter. People I don't even know. Uh, Maybe they were in an altercation and I saw just a clip of that altercation. I've made up in my mind who was in the wrong, how it all could have been avoided and what should happen next, you know? (laughs) So that's dangerous. I don't have all the information. Yeah. It's so easy to do. All we need is a bit of information and we take it and we run with it and we form an opinion. And sometimes that information just doesn't mesh well. It's just pieces and it's not the whole story. Yeah. So we need to evaluate the source, check the content. Um, As we talked about uh, biases, either through political bias or commercial bias, you know, the dairy companies were saying we need to drink milk. Oh, my goodness. We all (laughs) thought we were supposed to drink (laughs) gallons of milk every day. We're drinking it like this don't feel right. But I guess I guess my stomach's supposed to feel like this all day. I but, guess. <laughs> yeah, the research was telling us that. But who you paid know, for that research? The who big dairy it? company. Oh, my goodness. Children. Mm-hmm. They yep. were indoctrinating children with the belief that milk is like at the top of the pyramid. Cow milk, y'all. We cow don't even milk. drink cow milk like that. And we all living. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. If you weren't born in the 80s or early 90s, you might not understand. But this was a huge, this was mob level um, mm -hmm. propaganda that was through the government, through the schools. Yep. Celebrities was involved thinking they doing good. Drink milk commercials. <laughs> With milk mustache is looking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, by the way. You ain't gonna have me with a whole milk mustache on a billboard, but people was doing it. That was the thing. And mm -hmm. we all was just drinking milk. Crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. Like, I don't want my bones to break. I gotta drink a gallon of milk today. What? Insides messed up. Told Women. Up from <laughs> Women. the flow up. Osteoporosis, ladies. Gotta <laughs> drink your milk. Wow. Exactly. Wow. The lies. Yeah. So when you're evaluating a source and its content, check dates, check for verifiable facts or other evidence um, to support what is being said. And always consider if complex information is being oversimplified just to evoke emotion. Mm -hmm. And then as Kari mentioned, we get information in our feed that's customized to us, our interests, what our browsing history shows. So a good question to ask would be, do I trust this information because it is what I want to believe? Mm. So consider that. And then finally, don't spread misinformation. Okay. Can we just do not do that? I am queen of sharing. I love it. I probably get a whole bunch of sharing stuff that I send on the weekly basis because I love to share information. But I have to ask myself, is what I'm sharing true? OK, I'm going to put a pin in that. Alexis will share things like um, scams for getting uh, $10,000 in a year and it'll be something innocent like make your own coloring book and sell it on Amazon. That to me, I mean, maybe it's, it's misinformation. Maybe it worked. Who is it hurting? Another example, though. Sorry, mama. My mama will <laughs> share uh, news stories that to me obviously don't look factual. But all her friends sent it to her and she decided to send it to me. That's a problem. That is yeah. a problem. And when you don't know what to look for, that can happen to anybody. So it's like you got to be careful sharing news from uh, sources you don't recognize, maybe foreign sources. And again, we all want to be up on what's really mm -hmm. going on. And we all kind of just feel like someone's trying to pull the wool over our eyes because they is. They so, are. <laughs> so if we get a peek up under the wool, we like, oh, we got to tell everybody. Exactly. You know, we got the insider scoop. We got to share. It's our duty. But maybe it's not, y'all. Just be careful. Yeah. But Alexis, I want you to keep sharing them scams with me because I'm going to try <laughs> one of them. <laughs> well, that's what I got to share. Uh, thank you for sharing um, that tidbit card. Is there anything else you want to include um, to help us out avoid misleading information, misleading news articles? or For the most part, uh, news is short. It is not emotional and um, it is not as engaging as a book. So if you are reading an article or watching um, a news program and it starts to be entertaining, <laughs> mm. ask yourself, why am I entertained? Because that ain't the news's job. And second of all, maybe it's time to disconnect. <laughs> Should I disconnect? Well, as soon as you start being entertained by the news, it's a wrap. They got you. Well, I was I was entertained for years by the news and I yeah. loved it. Oh, do I sound like somebody that don't be entertained by the news? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> this is what I need to work on. <laughs> I love it. Why don't we take a quick break before we jump into the author and context? Sounds great. Yes. What can you share with us about the author and context for this book? 
So uh, Lisa Jewell is just an author whose writing I am in love with right now. I've read about three of her books, maybe four, um, ever since then she was gone, which is a book we covered in April of this year. I'm not going to get too much into her background, except I'll say that um, she came from abusive relationship, left that relationship. And it seems that the trauma in her life has inspired a lot of her books. So a lot mm. of them do come with darker themes. And for this episode, I'll go ahead right now and issue a, um, a TW, a content warning. Uh, there, there are aspects of sexual assaults in this book. Um, yeah, and some things that may be triggering for some of our listeners, and we want you to know that. Of course, the book doesn't dwell on these things or overindulge in them, but because they are key points of the plot, they come up more than a few times, and so you should know that. Um, so if you want more information on Lisa Jewell, perhaps her inspiration for this book we're covering today and other books she's written, please visit that episode we published April 14th of this year, Then She Was Gone by Lisa Jewell. Okay, well, thank you for that. Now let's hear a brief synopsis without spoilers before we take our deep dive. Kate's quiet English neighborhood has experienced several sexual assaults and one beautiful young girl is now missing. Across from Kate's family's home, police arrest a man. He's in his 30s. He's a loner. No one's ever seen him with a girlfriend. And this man is said to have recently lost his job due to sexual misconduct. Ooh, Kate sighs with relief now that the local creep is off the streets. But when the attacks continue and clues lead to her bedroom door, she must confront her prejudices and blind spots to reveal a shocking truth. Alexis, what were your first thoughts of Invisible Girl? Well, you know, I was excited to read another book from uh, Lisa Jewell. So you could have counted me in, just said yeah. the title and the author, and I was all in, all in. Yeah, we liked it. The, then she was yeah. gone, despite its yeah. dark themes. Um, well, I was looking forward to reading this book because I haven't read anything by the author that I haven't liked yet. And I think if you're a fan of mysteries with high stakes... I mean, life is involved and it ain't funny time like Mrs. Marple. OK, folks out right. here suffering. Then no I jokes. think you like it. Right. But I also don't feel down when I read her books. They are heavy, weighty themes. But it's not like every time I read a Toni Morrison books where I just got to cry for three days. Mm. Um, so I'll also add that. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm, I hope that okay. makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, so are we ready to take the spoiler field deep down? Oh, wait, are you spoiling this or have we learned how to spoil differently? Why? Is this a new book? Yes, yeah, for why? 2019 is new. Ah, uh, no, that's three years ago. I'm spoiling it. All right, <laughs> if we, off we go. <laughs> yes, again, content warning. This book contains themes that include sexual assault. And we begin in the before Part one. So immediately we're introduced to Sapphire Maddox. She spells her name S-A-F-F-Y-R-E. She's 17 years old. She's of mis- mixed ethnicity, beautiful, kind. She likes to read. Uh, many might even call her life boring. You know, she's not dating. She ain't in these streets. She's just a girl that likes to be at home with her books and her family. She doesn't have a mom. Speaking of her family, when she was 10, also something terrible happened to her that she doesn't disclose to us, the reader, right away. And she rarely discusses this with anyone. To cope with what happened to her at 10 years old, she began cutting herself. And that's when she finally met Rowan. Um, But more on him later. So we meet Sapphire during one of the most frightening moments of her life. She's chasing someone, a woman but we don't yet understand why. Valentine's night, 11.59 p.m. I duck down and pull my hoodie close around my face. Ahead of me, the girl with red hair is picking up speed. She knows she's being followed. I pick up my speed to match hers. I only want to talk to her, but I can tell from the way she's moving that she's terrified. I slow down at the sound of muffled footsteps behind me. I turn and see a figure coming after us. (gasps) I don't need to see their face to know who it is. It's him. My heart starts pounding beneath my ribs. 
Something bled through my body so hard and fast that I can feel the cut on my leg begun to throb. I pull back into the shadows and wait for the man to pass. He turns the corner and I see his body language change as he sees the woman ahead. I recognize the shape of him, the angles of his body, and I know exactly what he is planning to do. I move from my hiding place in the shadows. I stride out toward the man, toward danger. My actions my own, but my fate left wide open. And we continue. Creeps and geeks. So we meet Kate. Kate is unrelated to Sapphire. Forget about Sapphire for a second. There's like three main protagonists in this book. And it's interesting because only one of them speaks in first person. And I think you'll remember from Then She Was Gone, there's this weird like ominous voice for a couple of the characters. Right. This book doesn't quite do that. It has one character that speaks in first person and the other, um, their, their story is narrated in third. Uh, and it flows really well. I don't know how she does this, but I ain't going to complain. What did you think, um, Alexis? Did it bother you that you're taken out of first person with no reason, with no explanation? No, thrown- you know, those things don't bother me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we meet Kate. Kate's daughter is on the phone because a man is following her and she wants her mom to stay on the line until she arrives home safely. Her daughter's name is Georgia, by the way. So Georgia called up her mom and was like, hey, mom, somebody's following me. Just stay on the line with me till I get home. And Kate's like, oh, dear. OK, no problem. Um, so Georgia walks through the front door and Kate can see a man across the street. And she's like, oh, I hate that creep, whoever he is. She, um, Kate, Kate's family, by the way, moved to town temporarily. They're from a bigger city, um, but their home is under repair, like some natural disaster happens. So while it's being remodeled, uh, they picked a town like out the blue. They were like, this town will be cute. Let's stay here and just have a new life for a little while. But although this town is supposed to be safe and posh, it's actually kind of unfriendly and creepy. It's like, pockets of it that are undeveloped (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no neighborhood community feel and Kate thinks how easy it would be for a bad person to abduct abduct a girl in this town her Georgia for example she's like oh something happened to Georgia I wouldn't even know where to look okay so her husband's name Kate's husband's name is Roan and I'll say Rowan because that's easier for me but it's spelled R-O-A-N Roan Um, so Uh, Rowan, her husband, arrives home and Kate explains the fright that Georgia just experienced. She's like, maybe we should move. He isn't really that shaken. They won't be moving. He suggests Kate meet Georgia on her way home from now on. So just meet her at the train, which makes complete sense to me. And Kate's like, well, I don't want to embarrass her. She won't like having her mom with her as like a chaperone. So I'll just let her um, continue to be scared by strangers. It's weird. <laughs> that's that's so weird. Like, yeah. OK, yeah. but I thought you were concerned. But I do understand that her daughter likes her. Um, they have a good relationship so she doesn't want to ruin that at all and to not ruin that she's also willing it seems to risk her daughter's safety a little bit like you just walk home alone so I can still be the cool mom Um, Mm -hmm. and then (laughs) Rowan gives uh, Kate a look that's like okay if something happened to her it's all your fault Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so obviously they marriage ain't the greatest (laughs) okay in fact they're on the verge of breaking up Okay, this is just a little inside information, a little tea, if you will. Okay, so Tilly, a friend of Georgia's, stops by Kate and Rowan's home, the family home. She and Georgia settle into girl talk and Kate starts feeling like alienated from her daughter. Kate's a little needy. She's a needy mom. A little? (laughs) So she's like, oh, Georgia has a friend, which is great. And her friend is Tilly, who's so sweet. But now I don't have anyone to talk to. <laughs> and then the son. <laughs> Woman, get some friends. Shoot. Yeah, Sick get a life, girl. Ready. Yeah, it's true. So then her son enters and everything is perfect. She loves her boy. His name is Josh and he adores his mom. He comes in right away. And he's like, I love you, mom. What's for dinner? He gives her a hug and a kiss. And she's just like, oh, my boy, you're so great. He's like, what, 14, 15? Yep, 14. 16. 17 so, but he 14, is her constant 14. 
His mood doesn't change like George's. He's just always a little ball of love for his mom. Um, Look, it get dark real quick. Tilly is assaulted on her way home from visiting Georgia. A strange man grabbed her and touched her. It was horrible. Tilly couldn't see his face. That's what she says. So Georgia calls the police. Actually, Tilly comes running back to Kate's house. And Kate's like, should, I, should we? Shook, yeah. And Kate's like, should we call the police? And Georgia's like, yeah, mom, we should. And Georgia's like, girl. And she called the police, the, key, the mm-hmm. daughter. And soon Tilly, Tilly's mother, the police and all of Kate's family are in the kitchen and Kate can't help but feel like all of this is her fault somehow. She's not a good person. She reminds herself of this constantly. As a reader, we're like, where'd I come from? Yeah, that was like left field. What how, who, what you do? Yeah. Yeah. So. Kate decides, I think days later, to call the police about the man who lives across the street because that's the man that she suspected was following Georgia that one day. Later, she speaks to Tilly, Kate does, and Tilly tells Kate that what she said happened never happened. Tilly lied. Tilly's like, I'm sorry, I be lying. I I lie. I was never assaulted and I feel bad for making it up. Tilly's mom is embarrassed, but Kate's not buying any of this because why would Tilly, sweet, sweet Tilly, lie? Right. The police, however, follow her call and question the man across the street. And Kate starts changing her path to avoid that man's house or the house that man lives in. Because she doesn't she feel bad about um, having called the police on him. But she still feels he's creepy. So she's like, feels bad about calling police, but also never wants to run into him ever. Mm-hmm. Um, so sex attack in broad daylight. This is the headline on the paper. And it freezes the blood in Kate's veins. She notices this headline when she's walking home one day, gets lost and realizes there's no one around her. She runs into the sub sub development that uh, was originally built to house um, people of low income as if they were wealthy. It was like a social experiment, but it fell apart. The government didn't want to fund it. The neighborhood didn't like it. So whatever. But it's like this weird little subculture in their uh, in their neighborhood and mm-hmm. no one's around her. And then she sees this newspaper headline, sex attack in broad daylight. Later on, her husband arrives home late again. He's a child psychologist, by the way. It's like the only people he can relate to are troubled teens. He barely knows his own children. Kate shares the headline with her husband and he's shocked. Broad daylight. Rowan reminds Georgia to be careful. He's like, hey, girl. Oh, my daughter. Be careful. Some creeps out here. It's Valentine's Day. And Kate um, feels that she must buy her husband a card because that's like what people do on this day she's like so I guess I'll do it uh years ago by the way she thought he was cheating on her so she went through all of his emails and messages she like hacked into his computer went through his phone and she read the private records of his patients especially one called Sapphire Kate wanted evidence that Rowan was having an affair with her with the child Kate's investigation ended in her confessing to her husband losing his faith and drowning in shame. So that's part of the reason she feels like she's not a good person. Exactly. She read, yeah, she read private records of these troubled children. They never allowed, gave her permission to do that. They don't, they're not even of age to give her permission. She was sneaking. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So Rowan and Kate exchange Valentine's Day cards and he asks if she's ready to move forward. His card is like it has a Banksy on the front and some about a Band-Aid. And it's like, are you ready to heal the stitches or something cheesy? And she's it like, my- <laughs> OK, <laughs> so in her mind, she's like, my stitches are yours. Who hurt who? Hmm. Mm-hmm. But she's relieved. She's like, you know, maybe we can move forward after all this terribleness so many years ago. But something still bothers her. She can't help but feel that her original suspicions weren't unfounded. And his Valentine's Day card kind of feels like an admission, like, but anyway, so she dist- distracts herself, but by searching the web and checking the mail at the front door, there's an envelope in the mail for her husband, a card on Valentine's Day. Okay. And the address is written in like this feminine cursive. 
She puts the envelope down and she's like, not again. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I will trust him. I'm making the Mm -hmm. choice to trust. Mm -hmm. Choose trust. Choose trust and choose Mm -hmm. your choices. That night, Kate and Ron are supposed to have a romantic night out. He walks in, sees the envelope addressed to him and he leaves. He's gone out for a run, leaving the envelope on the table. And she's like, well, if it was something... I shouldn't see. He wouldn't have left it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He loves running, by the way. He's always going up for a run. Mm-hmm. Josh, her boy, comes downstairs, gives his mom a Valentine's Day card and a kiss. He's such a sweet boy. While Ooh. she's plating his meal, Kate sees Georgia opening the envelope addressed to Rowan. <laughs> Kate freaks out like, what are you doing, Georgia? Oh, my goodness. I can't believe you did that. And Georgia's like, first of all, that's my daddy. Second of all, this is your husband. <laughs> You You should should know. know. Uh, Georgia is the only one with common sense lately. She like, this your husband? You can't open this envelope? That don't even make no sense. Who is sending your man cards? Who? Who? This the daughter. Okay, woman to woman. Okay, but um, (laughs) Kate is like, Georgia, shut up. You don't know nothing. And she takes the envelope and shoves it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. Continuing. The best thing that ever happened to you. So Sapphire, back in the day when she was in therapy with Rowan, liked her therapy sessions. She was picturing a white headed weirdo, but Rowan wasn't that. He had piercing blue eyes, sharp cheekbones and cool shoes. He was like the cool uh, older man you could kind of have a crush on, but also who could be your friend and who you could trust. I don't know. Just made that character up. (laughs) He asked her right away, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And it was exactly what she needed to hear. And she responds, everything, everything was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Her mother died before she was born. Then her grandmother. How did her mother die before she was born? Oh, did her mother die before she was born? Hmm. I don't know why. I heard mother died when she was a young girl, I thought. That makes sense. Uh, That makes sense. I think of cancer. And then her grandmother died. A teacher who had just got married, who she liked, died. Uh, That teacher died of cancer. Um, Her Mm -hmm. grandfather gets sick eventually. But anyway, her grandfather and her brother are her whole family right now. Spoiler, her grandfather is going to die and it'll just be her brother. So she responds Um. everything, everything. She still doesn't tell Rowan what happened to her when she was 10 years old. She tells them everything else terrible that happened around that event. And then almost immediately he asks, what is the best thing that ever happened to you? And she's like, was you listening? I'm sad. (laughs) But then she starts thinking and she's like, you know what? One day at school, they brought an owl and that owl looked at me and I looked at it and it was the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. And then she starts talking about love and the love she felt for that owl. And how she loves her grandfather and her brother and how they're so great to her. Even though they're a small family, they're a great family. So back to the forward, back to today. She sees him say that he moved into, she saw him the day, I'm sorry, he moved into town with his family. So, um, Their therapy sessions have ended. Years have passed. She's walking the street and sees Rowan move into this house in this neighborhood. She doesn't know he's moving in there temporarily. Um, Actually, no, they're still in therapy. I'm sorry. They're still in therapy when that happens. Yeah. He never mentioned he was moving. She just saw him moving into the the house. Um, Then one day he said they were ready to end their sessions and she was devastated. They'd been meeting for years and it was all about to end this this moment. These moments talking to Rowan were like some peace in her day, in her life. So Mm -hmm. for him to be like, "Ah, I think we can end it. She she hadn't hurt herself like she did let him know or he did know she was cutting herself at one point. That's why she was in therapy. But he never knew why she still hadn't told him what happened to her at 10. And now he's saying she's made significant progress that they can they can end their sessions. And she feels like she's just left out there without a boat, without a paddle. You know, and mostly because she hasn't truly revealed all that's going. The worst thing that's happened to her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes Sapphire imagines herself to be a ninja, by the way. <laughs> like she feels like she can be invisible if she wants to be. 
She's tall, model-esque and beautiful. But when she puts a hoodie on, it's like no one even sees her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she also takes classes at the dojo and she feels like, no, I, I am actually a ninja. All right. She's experienced. Yeah. So that's actually how she saw it from across the street. She had her hoodie on. She was doing that little invisible thing she does. And she saw Rowan being too friendly with a woman too young and too much not his wife. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Then we meet Owen. Okay. Owen is called into the office at work. If you're like, who's Owen? This is the first time you're meeting him. Don't worry. So he's called into the office at work and they're like, Owen, have a seat. And he's like, yeah, hello. Uh Uh-huh. Um, Owen, we're going to have to let you go and investigate some accusations being made against you. What? What are the accusations? (laughs) What are the accusations, Alexis? That he um, was purposely throwing sweat on people and being real close to them at a Christmas party. He was inappropriate at a Christmas party. Specifically to women, to female students. So first of all, the girls feel feel like he he doesn't he favors the male students and doesn't give them respect for their opinions. He doesn't teach them on the same level as the male students. This is how two girls that step forward feel. And then at a party at school, like Alexa said, he was throwing sweat on them. He asked them sexually inappropriate questions, a lot of other stuff. And he's like. First of all, I don't even like teenage girls, <laughs> so I would never spend more time with them than necessary. Um, I'm a great teacher. I'm furious. How dare they? I'm also blindsided. Like, where does this even come from? Mm-hmm, and they're mm-hmm. like, OK, calm down. We're going to escort you off the premises <laughs> again. You're not fired. We just got to investigate. And he's like a small voice in his head is like, did you do something? He's like, no, shut up, small voice. <laughs> and so he's like, <laughs> He is um, like that. As he's walking around in the middle of the day when he should be at work, he's like, oh, my goodness, what is life? What is going on? He looks at the school moms around him, oblivious, consumed with their children. He was like, what purpose do you people serve in society? It's just a fleeting thought he has. Owen lives with his aunt, Tessie. His mom died when he was young. She had a brain aneurysm. It was sad. Tessie is often away. And locks every single door in the house when she leaves. She doesn't trust him. This is his aunt, y'all. This is his aunt. He feels pathetic. He's 33 years old. He has no reason to care about anything. His aunt be like, you 35? You 35, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's time to go. You're too old to be living with me. But Tessie, I'm 33. Still too old. (laughs) Okay, so... um. He like seeks professional help online and falls into these human interest stories that confirm what he suspects. Women hate men. He, he clicks on it like Alexis was saying in the theme of the week. And he's like, oh, this article telling the truth. Finally, I've awoken. And so he's like, <laughs> yes, women do hate men. And they want to hurt them. Yes, women do want to hurt men. And he thinks about a time when an idiot girl across the street and her mom looked at him like he was creepy. And he was like, who do those idiots think they are? Oh, I hate women. Mm. And then he finds a kindred friend in a um, chat room or some forum online. Someone who also believes in women's rights. Women should have rights. Okay, as long as they don't encroach on mine. And also they hate us. And he Um, formed a he-man woman hater club. Yeah. And let's hate women together. We don't hate them. We want them to have rights, but we hate them. And also um, society is trying to push men like us out, making us be celibate while all these quote unquote good looking muscle bound men who will call chads. All these chads get the Stacey's and they just form idiot children and soon we'll have an (laughs) idiot society unless we do something. Uh Okay. The handle of this friend he found at your loss. That's his online name. Okay. Soon the police arrive. Hey, Rowan, you up in there? And Rowan's <laughs> like, yeah, I'm here. And so the police are like, uh, Rowan where were you? Or Owen. Oh, I'm sorry. Owen. Oh, it's tough. <laughs> so Owen is spelled O-W-E-N. Owen. Rowan is spelled R-O-A-N. But it's tough. So anyway, 
uh, the police knock on Owen's door. And Owen, Owen is like, what do you want? And they're like, where were you when these sex attacks occurred in the neighborhood? And he's like, not again with the women. Yeah, enough is enough. Two weeks later, he is called back to the school. He's like, finally, can I go back to work? And they like, oh, no, nah, because all the accusations were corroborated. He's so. Like, what? But look, we like you. You are a value member of staff. So if you could just take these sessions, these like teaching reprogramming sessions, we'll let you have your job back. We don't want a big deal out of this. OK. And all he thinks is like, y'all trying to brainwash me. I'm resigning. And so he resigns and he walks home. And as he's walking home, a jogger runs into him, a Chad type of guy. And Owen asks the runner, are you married? And the runner's like, excuse me, why is that any of your business? Owen realizes this is the husband and dad of the idiots across the street. <laughs> Not the idiots across the street. He's Perhaps. like, everything I've read on the forums is coming true. This Chad had a child with a Stacy and now they have a Stacy daughter. And I hate all these people. <laughs> it's all coming together. He's like, I got to talk about this with someone. So he decides to uh, reach out to at your loss and they meet in a public place like a cafe or something. Um, and Owen really just wants a friend. He wants someone that he can confide in about everything that's happening to him. Um, and this guy seems to be level headed, the only normal man in the world. Right. And so Owen's waiting for him and a guy walks in that looks nothing as he described. And Owen is like. Hmm. He, he like I don't know mm. if I should be taking advice from him I don't know right. if he's the friend I won't and the guy's like uncapped there stays on his shirt his name is Bryn and he starts sharing his philosophy with Owen uh, the, the world is destroyed by Stacy's and Chad's it's time for a war Bryn hands Owen a package and a message the message is take it while they're sleeping the package is full of pills and Owen feels sick. He's like, wow, uh, wait a second. Huh? Whatever is wrong with me, I'm not as bad as men like Bryn. Mm -hmm. So I need to get up. I need to live and I need to move on. I really like this um, this piece here because he he was like, this is not who I want to be. This is not who I am. And in fact, this is going to move me to change any thinking that I have that um, may lean the other way. So I don't feel like he's changing yet. He just no. doesn't think he's as bad as Bryn. Right. But he also acknowledges that he has to look at people differently. And he did say that he had to change. That's that's why he could move a little forward as he did. Did he move forward? He just went back to his aunt's place and was like, now I'm really sad and I don't have a friend. Well, no, he went. Remember, he went to the chat. First of all, you are absolutely right. He starts a Tinder account yeah. and he meets a woman named Diana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So he's at least trying to meet people and like give people a chance to be his friend. Uh, and even maybe something women. more. Women specifically. Women yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, so for a full three hours, Diana makes um, Owen feel normal. They just like talk. She's not exactly as she described online. She's a little heavier. She has a kid, uh, but she's great. And he's like, wow, uh, this was like exactly what my life needed. So they drink way too much and they talk for a very, very long time. And he's walking home by himself and he's like on cloud nine. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I met someone that saw me. Mm hmm. On the way home, a girl is looking at her phone and really nearly runs into him. And when he's like, get off your phone, maybe you could see where you're going. She calls him some names. He calls her some crude names and it like disturbs his peace. But then he gets a text from Diana and all the rage melts away. Then he notices a girl looking at the house across the street from him where the idiots live. I know you, he thinks. Next part. Oh, <laughs> OK. After this part of the book is called after. What is it after you ask? Sapphire Maddox is now missing. What? Sapphire is right. Sapphire is missing and the neighborhood is alerted by police. Something about it bothers Kate. First of all, 
She's got her own mystery going on in her house that she's trying to solve. She don't know what it is, but something needs to be solved. That envelope that arrived on Valentine's Day for her husband, she saw the envelope and it was signed by Molly and the message was like juvenile. The card, I'm sorry, not the envelope. The card was signed by Molly and it was like, teach you the best. Giggle, giggle. And she was like, what kind of? Be my Valentine. <laughs> yeah, and Rose like, oh, it's one of the students. and um. What? And Kate's like, well, how did she get this address? And Ron's like, I honestly have no idea. And so Kate goes to put the the card back in the envelope and it don't even fit. And she's right. like, this, hmm. this ain't the card that came with this envelope. Hmm. OK, so Kate changes her routine one day and sees her husband in the city in the middle of the day. He didn't see her. It was odd. She said she had described it as like going to your kid's school when they don't expect you and like seeing them live in that other world. Anyway, um, it's odd. Later, he mentions that he met a colleague in the city and it seemed to explain everything away. He met someone for dinner. They are a colleague, a male colleague for lunch. Excuse me. Um, that colleague offered him a job opportunity and it's going to be great for everyone. They can buy couches now. Huh? And so. <laughs> So that occurrence stays in the back of Kate's mind. Also, the night of Valentine's Day, when they shared that date and quietly decided to give their marriage more effort, Kate went to bed, but she can't remember where her husband was. Was he alongside her or was he not? She can't remember. She was like, it's, he did go outside, but mm -hmm. but what time was it when he came back? And then we learned that during the early years of their marriage, guess what? You never guess. Rowan cheated. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. I was like, you know what? She reacted like this, but usually it comes from something else. Yeah. And finally, it's revealed that man is a cheater. Yeah, so Kate found out about the so-called affair. Uh, it was with an adult student, her age, actually Kate's age. Um, it ended... It sounded like Kate ended it. Kate met with the woman and was like, this is over. You done with my husband. <laughs> and it and happened right when they got um, married too, early in their marriage. So he's like in tears and he's like, are we over? And she's like, honey, we married. We're not over. We're in this together. And then she yeah. kept the moral high ground in their marriage. And she felt like he'll always know I'm better. And then he won't leave me. But then she started going through his stuff just a few years ago on suspect that he was cheating again. And he took the moral high ground. Like, how could you <laughs> betray the trust of my <laughs> students and your family? Oh, so, yeah. Um, years later, though, they were able to joke about his first affair and she saw that as growth. Also, okay. while, <laughs> while cleaning one day, now in the present, Kate finds Lycra running tights in her son's room and they smell strange and vile. Later, <laughs> she sees her husband wearing the same tights and he says they were clean in his drawer. Kate didn't clean them. She never removed them from Josh's room. And she's like, how did they get cleaned, folded and placed in my husband's drawer? Mm. Also, with the running tights, do you remember what she found with them? No. In Josh's room? A balaclava. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That face That's mask like a, hat. Yeah, a face scarf mask. kind of thingy. It covers your whole face except your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. One day, Kate arrives home and sees a man outside. It's Aaron, Sapphire's brother. He wants to talk. They enter the house uncle. alone. Oh, sorry, uncle. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. So Kate can't explain it, but for some reason she trusts this man implicitly. He's got questions. Sapphire is missing, and it's just so weird that he she would be in that Sapphire would be in front of Rowan's home. You know, uh, she hasn't been a patient of Rowan's in years. Also, I found this list in her room, and on that list is Josh's name. So he's Josh like, can you just and Rowan? Oh, Josh and Rowan. So, um, so, yeah, her uncle's like, can you please, I'm just trying to find Sapphire. Can you please help me? This is so weird. And Kate's like, yeah, I'll keep my eye out. I don't know uh, why this, she would have this list and their names would be on it, the men in my house. And so she's, they, um, he leaves, Aaron leaves, and Kate is like, shook. shook. Like, why are the names of my husband 
his son on the list of the found in this missing girl's room. Then the reader is taken to Sapphire's head before her disappearance. So we're going in a flashback. She was following Rowan. Remember she saw Rowan across the street talking to that young woman being too friendly. Mm hmm. She saw him that day he was in the city for lunch, too. And it becomes kind of a hobby for her watching Rowan. Anyway, um, she takes classes at the dojo, like like we said, and sometimes feels like a ninja, quiet and invisible watching Rowan. And it gives her like a sense of control in a life that often feels like it's spiraling out of control. Anyway, she sees Rowan check into a hotel the day he was in the city. He checked into that hotel with that beautiful young woman that he's been flirting with. And Sapphire is like, how could, how do these people get jobs where they can play with children's brains and their lives are falling apart? They're untrustworthy. Like what is going on? So Sapphire feels calmest by the way, when she's sleeping outside with nature. So she'll like break out of her house (laughs) at nighttime just to sleep outside. Remember she fell in love with that owl in school and it really just started this love of nature for her. Um, One night, a friend invites her over for like a New Year's party. And she's like, yeah, I'll come. And she sneaks out early so she can go sleep in the woods. And she steals a bottle of wine from the party and just has a party with herself outside (laughs) watching the fireworks. And she's like, "Mm, this is okay. I can do this. The peace that she experiences outside stops the pain. Like we said, she's no longer cutting herself. She hasn't for years. But now sleeping outside, she finally feels fixed. One night, though, after she snuck out from the apartment that she shares with her uncle and set up space in the woods, she sees two boys and they're talking about how this time next year, everything's going to be different. They'll be unmasked Uh and everyone will realize everyone's going to realize how they underestimated us. She sees one of the boys again another day in the woods alone feeding a fox. She's like, this is the craziest thing. She decides to approach him. It's Josh. She knows Josh. They met before at the dojo and she knows that Josh is Rowan's son. Mm. Also around this time, her grandfather gets sick. He dies. Uh, Sapphire goes into a depression. Um, Sleeping outside, though, and trying to take some control over her identity. She feels like she's morphing into an outside person, a a wild animal person. She's creating a fantasy in her head to help her cope with everything going on in her Mm -hmm. life. Um, So now it's just her and her uncle who I thought was her brother. You sure it's her uncle? It's her uncle. Oh, sorry. He's in his early thirties. You know, he's not dating because he's taking care of her and she worries about him. Like, am I hindering you from having a life? Mm -hmm. Um, And then one day, while being invisible and walking the street, she runs into someone she used to know. A boy named Somebody that I used to know. (laughs) Okay. A man named Harrison John. And just like that, Sapphire begins cutting herself again. Mm. The pain, the pain feels more powerful than the hold Harrison has over her. Mm. So she just run into Harrison John on the street. He saw her. She saw him. He recognized her. She recognized him. And just like that, she's cutting herself again. We're then taken to the present. So all of that was a flashback to the not so distant past. We're now taken to the present with Owen. Uh, Police are at his door. He's naked. Or actually, this is kind of the past, too, because you already know Owen's arrested. But anyway, he's naked. He just got out of the shower and has accidentally cut himself. An officer enters the room, making sure he doesn't touch anything while he gets dressed. He's not even allowed to grab a tissue to clean the blood off of his face. He's escorted out of the house. And there is press out there. How did they find out he'd be arrested? Actually, he's not even arrested. He's just being put in a cop car by police, which sounds like it's being arrested. But you can actually actually uh choose not to go yeah. but they do have a warrant to search his room they have so a warrant. It's like, he can't be there they want to they manhandling him they won't let him get yeah. dressed properly yeah. so he looking real gruff and they mm-hmm. carrying him out while the cameras are in full view talking about how they get there 
Yeah, the police are like, we don't know. Here's the press, but we didn't call him. <laughs> so the press <laughs> photograph him and he's taken to the station for questioning. That photo with his hair wild, his mouth agape and dried blood on his face makes its way to the newspaper's front page. Of course it does. Course. He's not even under arrest yet. He's only being questioned. But in the public's mind, he's Sapphire's killer. At first, there's absolutely no evidence and the police are talking in circles and trying to make him incriminate himself. But then police find the pills in his drawer. Owen, why didn't you get rid of the pills? Mm. Why didn't you flush those pills? I was worried about Owen. Yeah. So and then, girl, they find Sapphire's blood near Owen's bedroom window. Mm. He is officially under arrest. (laughs) Police then find violent words about women written by Owen in incel chat rooms. And those are those involuntary celibates that he was hanging out with online. Mm -hmm. Owen says he was just upset. He was trying to fit in with a new group of friends. Uh, He has no idea what an incel even is. How Um, did I get here? This is all so crazy. What about the pills? And then Owen's like, look, someone named Bryn gave them to me. I met him on a chat room. The pills, I was never going to use them, but I just didn't discard them yet. I was going to, though, for sure. OK, that is not me. Also, they interviewed an old student of his who was like, yeah, he's a creep. <laughs> he did this, this and this. And, you know, he was inappropriate all the time. And he's like, no, women hate men. Don't you know you should read this chat room? Wait, <laughs> no, no, that's not what I mean. <laughs> um, so he ain't in a good situation. Back to Sapphire and her flashbacks. So she sees Josh in the woods again one day. She introduces herself and they become fast friends. He can't get over how beautiful she is and she's grateful to have a friend she can fight in. In that moment, she just officially met Josh. She tells him what she hadn't told Rowan for years. Wow. An older an older boy she thought was a friend touched her when she was 10. It hurt and he did it three times, three different times, three different days. That's when she began cutting herself. And today she saw that same boy again. He's a man now. His name is Harrison John. The only way for her to be okay is to get revenge. That's how she feels. That's the only way she'll be free of him. Josh goes, yeah, you're right. That's the only way. And I'll help you. (laughs) It's like I'm all in. I'm all in, friend. Now let's go to the present. The press... Find the man Owen calls Bryn. Bryn's interview is published in the news. Bryn is disgusted by Owen. Owen makes it hard for men like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, Bryn shares, Bryn slightly shares some of his philosophy. And he's like, we're just trying to have a fighting chance in society. But then people like Owen ruin it for all of us. Mm. And Owen's lawyer shows him this and Owen is devastated. He's like, that is not what happened. And that is, Bryn is a sicko. Days of prison food later, (laughs) Owen is told that a man named, a, um, a woman named Alicia says she knows him. And at this point, Owen feels like he's in an alternate reality where anything is possible. Mm -hmm. So he's like, yeah, sure. I never heard of Alicia, but if she (laughs) says she know me, she must know me. Uh, The the police keep talking and he does remember more about that night. The night that he saw the woman looking at the house across the street from his looking at his neighbor's house. That woman was a girl and that girl was Sapphire Maddox. Uh Oh, the missing girl. The missing girl. But he's relieved because he's like, wait a second. I didn't kidnap her because now he kind of feels like he can't trust himself because when he drinks a lot, he does things perhaps that he can't remember. He don't know. Uh, He can't remember, not remember it. So when they say, well, a woman named Alicia knows you, he's like, yes, yes, that was it. There was someone saying the name Alicia. And then the girl that is now missing looked at me. Um, And she asked me to help her get on the roof of like a garage. And from that roof, I don't know what she was doing, but I helped her up. I was very happy that night. Um, You know, I had a date (laughs) and and I ran into that girl a few times on the street and she's always been so pleasant. Like I told her Merry Christmas once and she told me Merry Christmas and she's just a great girl. Okay, from the little interaction I had with her. 
So when she came down off the roof, she said, ow, and that must have been when she cut herself. And that's why you found the blood. For real. That's what he that's said. It. And the police ow. are like, mm. the police are like so eager to send him to the guillotine. But they like, fine, I guess we'll check the roof of the garage. Fine. Because <laughs> that's our jobs. We got to investigate. Soon he is released. Obviously, evidence was found that exonerated him. Okay. But he is determined. <laughs> he is determined now to not be the man anyone could expect of something like this ever again. So he takes responsibility. He takes ownership. He's like, when I drink, I forget stuff. Maybe I said something crazy to these girls. So he writes a letter of apology to those two students that came forward. He thanks them for having the courage to come forward. And he said he doesn't remember what what he his um his recollection doesn't match theirs. But he wholeheartedly accepts their side of the story as being truthful. And he even went into a little admission um, because he didn't want anyone to say he wrote this letter and was forced to do it. He wanted to go above and beyond. Mm hmm. He also visits his dad and he's like, hey, why did you leave me and my mom? And I remember you called my mom a whore. Was she a whore? He knows she wasn't, but he just wants his dad to say it. So we get um, some evidence here that his dad never treated women properly. Mm -hmm. And um, Owen never uh, had an example of a healthy relationship in his family uh, for uh, men toward women or uh, women being treated you know, as they should be or men um, acting as they should. So yeah. he's always been just a little confused. It's not as if this is an excuse, uh, but he confronts his dad and lets him know, you don't want me in your house right now. I've just been exonerated for a terrible crime and you don't want me in your house right now. Like, what does this say about us? Mm -hmm. What does it say about you? So he makes his dad confront who he is. Um, he also submits to sensitivity training. He makes some friends in there. When they walk, when he walk in the room, everybody like, oh, <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> I remember you from the paper. Uh, but weeks go by and he makes progress and, you know, he like, it's fine. So um, he's rehired at his school. He gets his job back and his life is moving forward. Meanwhile, Kate is still solving the puzzle. She urges Tilly's mom to ask her daughter again, did something happen to you? And, um, the mom casually mentions how Tilly always respected their family. And so Kate's like, maybe Tilly didn't come forward because she loved our family so mm -hmm. much and she didn't want to hurt our family. So the mom calls uh, Kate and is like, she admits it did happen. What do I do? And Kate's like, I got to go by. <laughs> What's like? Because Ooh, oh, okay. Uh, 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 I got a uh, bye. Right. It, it was. I went out there, asked the woman to tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us, and then was like, "I can't help you. I can't. I can't do it." But she does get the courage to confront her Josh, her boy that she loves so much, about the running tights with the odd smell, and he confesses in tears that he was wearing them and he peed on himself. Okay, is that what you want to hear, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she hugs her boy and she said, I'm so sorry. She's heartbreaking for him. However, why was he wearing running tights? He don't run. Mm. Then one day, Josh decides to tell Kate the truth. Her world shatters and they both go to the police. Uh oh. So the truth. Yeah, Josh and Sapphire were hunting Harris and John, but it kind of makes sense because they were looking for hard evidence. To bring him to the police without hard evidence, they couldn't because Sapphire knew in her heart. If Harrison John lives over here, that's the reason for the assault. Like, even though he was only two years older than me when he assaulted me, something like that. It's a it's not far. Yeah, they they're weren't not, far in age. Mm -mm, thank you. Like 18, 19. <laughs> he was never reprimanded. And of course, he grew up thinking that kind of abuse was Okay. He's entitled to do mm -hmm. inflict that on people. So I know in my heart of hearts that he is the reason why these assaults have been happening in the neighborhood. But we have to get hard evidence or the police won't do anything. And he's always been charismatic, Harrison John. So she'll, she's like, he'll just talk his way out of it. Um, so Josh starts following, Har following Harrison. And when Kate hears this, she's like a little proud of her boy. She's like, wow, you're like a little Superman for this girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, my boy. I love him so much. <laughs> So Josh follows Harrison one night into a movie theater where Harrison is with um, a woman, a girl, and 
he's like overly touchy and the girl obviously is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Then they leave the theater and he starts it looks like even trying to force himself onto this girl in a weird way. And so Josh confronts him instead of getting the evidence. He's like, hey, back off. And so Harrison throws Josh against a wall, tells him, I will actually kill you. And Josh urinates on himself. So that's how the Lycra pants got all pissy. <laughs> so Josh found the card that was sent to his dad. It was from Alicia. And it was like, I'm going to kill myself if you don't leave your family. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so <laughs> Josh called uh, Sapphire was like, what do I do? I, my mom is just the perfect mom. I hate for her to read this. I hate my dad. What do I do? And Sapphire was like, well, just write another card and put it in the envelope. And so that's when he was like, from Molly, <laughs> you's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Why you be so, my Valentine? But he didn't bother to get the same size car. Oh. Well, those are the things. He was a boy, just a young boy. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is the part they told police. Alicia was outside of Rowan's family's home and Sapphire recorded the interaction between Rowan and Alicia. In order to get a better view, she was hopped up onto the roof by Owen. Mm -hmm. That's when he was like drinking and all happy from his date. And she was like, hey, can you give me a lift onto the roof? And he was like, sure, neighbor, because <laughs> he's an idiot, kind of. So um, from the roof, she recorded them arguing. And the look of Rowan's, Rowan's face was like in full on rage. And he hit Alicia. Sapphire hopped off the roof. Ouch. Remember, she cut herself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she starts running after Alicia like, are you OK, girl? Hey, wait. But then she feels someone following them both. And this is the scene that we were introduced to at the beginning of the book. There is a man following both Alicia and Sapphire. It's Harrison John. Ooh. Sapphire overpowers him with her set of skills and breaks the three fingers he used to hurt her as a child. Harrison promises, I am going to kill you when I see you again. Also, ouch, ouch, <laughs> ouch, because it's three fingers. Like triple ouch, ouch, ouch. So it's, Alicia's like, girl, you can come stay with me. So Sapphire has been staying at Alicia's house in hiding. Um, but to save Owen and because she's finally ready, Sapphire ur urges Alicia to go to the police with at least part of the story to exonerate Owen. Yay! She's not Yay. dead! She's not dead. And then when Josh and Kate go to the police with the story that Josh told his mom, um, Harrison's fingerprints and closed caption, a uh, closed caption, closed circuit video uh, is found of him near um, the scenes of reported assaults. So he becomes a person of interest. But then they like arrest him. They yeah. get enough evidence to like arrest him. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so he is uh, found to be guilty of m many of the assaults, but he has solid alibis for other dates. So there seems to have been two creeps, two bad men, two criminals. Oddly, Harrison was briefly a patient of Rowan's as a child, and he used to write rape fantasies as a child mm -hmm. and displayed um, behavioral problems that led to him being a patient of Rowan's. Sapphire shows Alicia the video she recorded from the roof um, one night, and Alicia is like, I have to tell you something. Um, Rowan is a man who... You can believe anything about him because it's obvious he's wearing a mask. Mm. And sometimes that mask comes off and he scares you. Like some of the things he asked me to do romantically um, were scary. I found him um, enjoying himself while reading one of his students essays one day. And that essay, Sapphire, was a rape fantasy. Mm. What? Mm. Disgusting. Final part. The now. So the police have found Bren. Yay. His Yay. real name is Jonathan and his home is full of enough to earn him a place on their watch list. So they just constantly monitoring Jonathan. He ain't got no rights. They listen to his calls. They be showing up like, hey, can we look in your room? Ain't nothing he can do. OK. Owen is working. 
He lives on his own now. Got he's a apartment. real boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got his own apartment, a double bed. He feels like he has a place in the world. And he's got a girlfriend that Diana, she stuck around. Aww. Kate has left Rowan and she lives in a newly remodeled house with her kids. She's starting a new life where she's not going to let that man con her anymore. Sapphire sees Alicia every week now. They're friends. Sapphire is happy with her uncle and the kitten he bought for her. They are Sapphire's family and they're enough. But nothing is perfect. And Sapphire thinks of a time months ago when she was meeting Josh under the cover of night. He showed up in a black outfit with a mask on his face. And she said, where did you get that creepy mask? And he said, it was in my dad's drawer. Come on, let's go hunting. Mm. The end. Should we take a break? Yeah. All right, let's do it. And we're back. Alexis, before we give our final verdict, I just wanted to share some positive news. A little bit of society says. How does that sound? Oh, sure. Share away. So society says is when we share your comments, readers, with the rest of our lit society. And these are from Apple Podcasts. The first is from LESB116. And they say, great podcast for people who love to read. I've been listening to Lit Society for months, and it's such a delight. Listening to the two fabulous hosts discuss books in all different kinds of genres is like sitting in on a really good book club. I love listening to episodes on long car rides and made it through two today. Hey, thanks for this great cast. I hope you mean two car rides and not just two of our episodes, but I know you mean, you mean the car ride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Love to hear it. And then we have another comment from I-Z-Z-Y-J-M-I-L-L-E-R. They say great book conversations. I love their commentary on books, themes, and life in general. They are insightful, witty, and just wildly funny. I send their episodes to my reader friends all the time to get more people to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, readers. (laughs) We thank you. And with those positive words, Alexis, please, what's your final verdict of Invisible Girl? And would you recommend this book? Let me tell you. So I'm visiting my family, right? I'm in Florida. And, um... I was reading this book yesterday and then I had to walk back to the apartment that I'm staying in. Oh, no. And it's like, was um, it nighttime? No, it wasn't even (laughs) nighttime. It was like, I think it's like a thousand feet or something. It's not very far. I came out the apartment. I looked and there was a man (laughs) standing two doors down, smiling. And I was like scared the whole walk home. (laughs) I hadn't finished the book yet. I was scared (laughs) the whole walk home. I was looking behind. I was scared. I don't read books like that and be scared. But this time I was. (laughs) I don't know why. I was in fear. Nervous. (laughs) I was checking locks. And then you have to go. So where we stand is in the leasing office so no one's uh-huh. there and you open uh-huh. the door to the leasing office and then you go into your room so I'm like hurry up and shut the door anyway it's yeah. scary I was scared this book scared <laughs> me and yet still I enjoyed it <laughs> <laughs> I understand completely and maybe we should be scared more often than we are well I was indeed I scared know. I tell you but I did enjoy the book <laughs> I was um involved from beginning to the end my emotions were high and low I was concerned I was I was rooting for Owen I was rooting for yeah. him always even like, with all the evidence against him yes you just yeah you root for him a bit yeah. I, I I wanted him to win because he didn't sound like he didn't sound like he did it and I'm concerned about what the women were saying but I'm glad he's like well I'm not gonna say you wrong but I probably did do that what what did he say he said I'm not gonna say you wrong I don't remember the events that way but I'll accept your story yeah wholeheartedly Mm -hmm. wholeheartedly so I am saying I'm wrong oh I I don't remember it being that way but I wholly wholeheartedly accept and I know that I black out when I drink (laughs) 
So I'm going to stop drinking too. He said possibly. He 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 the actually the police told him maybe you one of those people that black out when you drink and you oh, display the a personality that yeah. you don't you're not familiar with when you're drinking. So anyway, mm-hmm. all of that. I really did enjoy the book. Definitely recommend it. A uh, note there there is strong language in the book as well. Um, but mm-hmm. I do I did enjoy it. I did indeed enjoy it. How about you, Kari? Would you recommend it? Did you enjoy the book? I enjoyed it and I have recommended to a, a few people. I, I um with the caveat that there there is um language and also uh subjects that yeah, may be triggering. Subjects. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you why Owen and Rowan? Do you think that was on purpose? Like all the men in this, it's not a men, it's not an apology to men, but it is, I think the purpose of the story is to make you think, what assumptions do you make about people, especially people of the opposite sex? Mm-hmm. It, it's about and why. I think it does tackle um toxic masculinity is that the expression toxic masculinity for sure but it also from the other side is like why do we suspect why do we think some men are creeps and some men aren't yeah and when really the creep mm-hmm. yeah and so owen describes himself as not a bad looking guy but mm-hmm. yet everybody considers him creepy and what is mm-hmm. the basis for that is he not hit that next level to be a Chad that everybody mm-hmm. wants. So it does challenge your um your vision of people. And like, why was he being cussed out by that woman? Because he was walking down the street and he was feeling a little happy about himself. Mm-hmm. What was the answer? It also uh, made me think how everyone in this book is where they are in life because of their choices. Mm-hmm. So Owen lives he hasn't launched he lives in his aunt's room she don't want him there uh he's not social so he's never had a um romantic friend or a companion just a friend um also he is um not confronting the issues in his personality the way he looks at women and then you have Kate who is like living her life in the shadows of her marriage. Like as long as she's married, everything is OK. Mm-hmm. But she's not looking at her husband for who he is right. and what he's doing. So she's in that terrible situation because of her choices. Right. You know, um, so, yeah, I, I thought this book had some really great subjects. Um, uh, and in the end. What do you think? Was Rowan the other perpetrator or was it Josh? Um, I think it was Rowan. I really do. So when when I first read the book, I, I right away I said, oh, of course it was Rowan. But I'm also thinking, why couldn't it be Josh? Because he had but, but, alibis for all those times. But I not think Josh. It, oh, Josh. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. So both of those came up. Sorry, a little confusion about the names there. But yeah, both of those came up to me. But um, because then he was like, I'm going to reveal myself. And then he explained it. And I was like, hmm, is that really the proper explanation? What was he talking about with his friend when he said they'll be unmasked and people will, you know, wish they had never underestimated them? Yeah. Was he part of some uh, group that was trying to assault women? And then once he formed this friendship with the beautiful Sapphire, he lost the need for that group in his mind. That could be a possibility. It could also very easily have been his dad, the other culprit, because his dad also has some issues. I'm leaning heavily so. towards the dad because of the um, the mask on, mask off kind of thing. The violence that you see in his face and his actions and the the son, Josh, doesn't really have those um, tendencies and he didn't seem Mm -hmm. to think anything of having um, the mask. Mm -hmm. It's a 14 year old boy, but it, it, you know, Mm -hmm. it it is. The question is out there. It's open. Who could it really be? And I like that it left it open. Mm -hmm. I like when books do that. It's like it could go either way. I like also that Sapphire wasn't outright raped, but the assault that she endured was highlighted and given the respect that I felt like, or not respect, but her feelings were given the respect that, go ahead. 
No, I'm listening. I'm oh. co-signing. Because <laughs> um, maybe authorities at this point would have told her to get over it. Or, or not even just authorities, uh, family members. Not in this book, but, you know, in another situation, I could see that happening because she wasn't outright raped. But what happened to her was wrong. It happened to her. It hurt and it still was hurting her. And that's what mattered. I like the choice that the author made not to have an outright um, rape in this case. What she went through as a child was enough to stick with her for the rest of her life. And that's how the truth that's closer to the truth. And that Uh, expression um, there just gives me chills um, mm -hmm. when you speak about that, because it's so true. You maybe if it happens to you, you may minimize it. But it does have because an it wasn't as bad you. as what other women go through. It, it exactly. wasn't as bad as what other people go through. You know, that's the exactly. the conversation. It wasn't as bad as what other women go through. I should be able to cope with that. But this happened to her on three separate occasions, and it affected her. Took her to a dark place. She was cutting. She was hurting herself. And none of mm-hmm. the um, I don't recall any of the uh, other assaults being rape either right they were fondling right, exactly yeah mm-hmm. aggressively holding scooching up close on a woman mm-hmm. all of that but all of that counted all of that counted and sometimes people think that's okay and it's just not okay it's not okay at right. all get get out of yeah. my personal space right get out of my mm-hmm. personal space but yeah i love the and way even more than handled. that like Cause I want close talkers to get out of my personal space, but this is something else. Mm -hmm. And this is something that can affect people on a deeper level. And um, the pain that people feel after this is more than justified. So well done, Lisa Jewel. It's a violation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Still, Well, there you have it. Thank you for sharing that book with us, Kari. And what are we reading next Week. We are reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklute. Oh, it's a part one and part two. Yes, we'll be covering part one of that book because it's uh, a bit long, okay? Thank you for listening to Lit Society. We look forward to meeting up with you next week, Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and... Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us, because we love you too. There's also Spotify, where you can give us the five-star rating as well. We ask (laughs) that you please give us five stars and, you know, send us a message if you got some constructive feedback if you've enjoyed what you just heard tell a friend about Lit Society visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes this month's book list and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter and until next time readers read something read something read something